What is going on guys? Welcome back and today so we're going to learn how to make our Python code more professional. So let us get right into it. All right, so we're going to cover three points that are going to make your Python code more professional. And the first one is going to be type hinting. Now let's say we have a basic function, which we call some calculation. And we have some values x and y and then a return value, which is x plus y squared, for example. So this is a simple Python function. And of course, Python is dynamically typed. So technically speaking, I can pass whatever I want, I can say 10 and 20. I can pass, uh, I don't know, 10.78 and 8.91. And of course, since we have dynamic typing, I can also pass some strings. So I can pass hello, and world, which doesn't mean that I'm going to get a uh, meaningful result, I'm going to get an error. In fact, uh, if I run this, because you're going to see unsupported operand types for string and int. Um, the previous calls, however, work, we just need to print the result. Um, so this, this is dynamic typing in Python, I don't get any errors before I actually get to the line of code that say, hey, you cannot do this here, because it's not allowed because Python does not do any static uh, type checking, I don't say, okay, this is an integer. So I cannot pass a string here. This is something that works in Java, or is done in Java and C sharp and C++, but it's not done in Python. Now type hinting is not going to change the fact that Python is dynamically typed. But type hinting is a little bit more uh, for documentational purposes. So let's say I'm a developer, and this is the code of someone else. And I look at this function. Now, of course, in this case, I would immediately know that this is uh, meant to be applied on numerical values. But maybe I don't know that maybe the function is more complicated, uh, or maybe there are there are some alternatives. And maybe this function is not for all numerical values, but only for integers. So uh, if I want to specify for other developers, that the parameters, for example, have to be integers, what I do is I use a colon, not here, I use a colon after the parameter, and say int. And I do it here as well, int. And if I want to specify that the return value of the function is also going to be an int, then I go after the function definition function signature, and I add this arrow here and say int as well. So this basically says x is supposed to be an integer, y is supposed to be an integer, and the result of this function is supposed to be an integer. Now I can still go ahead and pass a string. Hello, world, or two strings. This is still going to work, I'm not going to get the error that I cannot run this script, it's just going to say, okay, it doesn't work, because it goes to that line executes it and says it doesn't work. I think Python is going to notice that as you can see here, Py, uh, PyCharm, not Python, PyCharm is going to notice that the expected type was int, but we got a string instead, uh, as you can see, but this is not an error. This is just a message that PyCharm tells me, uh, I can still run that code. So if I, for example, go with not a string, but with 19.28. And with, um, I don't know, 77.23, I'm still gonna get that error, right? Because you can see, okay, expected int, but got float instead. However, this would work since those are numerical values. So I would get if I print it, of course, I would get the result, it's not a problem. Uh, but still PyCharm is going to tell me that this is not what was expected here. Okay, so type hinting is mainly used for documentational purposes. So when I use a library, I want to know, okay, what parameter is expected here, it's just better for predictability. And there are also tools like MyPy, written like that MyPy, that allow you to check for the integrity or for the consistency of the typing. So for example, if I have something like some calculation, hello, world, this works from a Python perspective, yes, PyCharm is going to tell me that but it still works from a Python perspective. If I say my pi this file, it's going to say no, we have an error here because we have strings where we would expect integers. So <clears throat> with my pi, we can check for consistency, I have a video on this channel already about type hinting where I go a little bit into more detail. So you can check that out. It's a uh, part of the advanced Python tutorial series. Uh, but one more thing that I want to show you here is uh, what to do if you want to allow for multiple types. So let's say we don't want to allow for integers or floats, but we want to allow for integers or floats. So one of the two we want to allow for, uh, or 
maybe for integers and floats. So basically we allow both of them. And if we want to do that, we need to import something from the typing module. So we want to say from typing import union. This is the thing that we need to use here. And if I want to say, okay, X is an integer or a floating point number, I can say, okay, X is just a union of int and float like that. And this is also a union of int and float. And the return value is also a union of int and float. And I'm sure my camera is blocking that right now, right? So let me just put this down here as you can see. So uh, we have this type hinting here. Now this is going to be replaced in Python 3.10. You can watch my video what's new in Python 3.10 because in Python 3.10, we're going to have uh, the union operator. So in Python 3.10, this is not Python 3.10 yet, we're working with 3.9. So it's not going to work here. But in Python 3.10, we will be able to say x int and then this union operator uh, float, and it's going to have the same effect and we don't need to import anything. But type hinting is something that you might consider adding to your code to just make it more readable, more predictable, uh, and uh, just better overall. All right, so the second thing that you can do in order to make your Python code more professional is to use doc strings. So again, about documentation here, uh, but this time about real documentation, you wanna document your file, you wanna document your classes, your functions and so on. Now, of course, there are different ways to do that. People use different, um, I don't know, patterns or structures, different keywords sometimes. Uh, but in general, you might want to start by just documenting the, the file itself. For example, if you're publishing a package or uh, a, a significant sized project, significantly sized project on GitHub, for example, you might want to start with a basic doc string, uh, which is uh, started with three, three quotation marks here. So a multi line string, essentially, and you start with something like this is my new library, for example, and then you can specify some information like uh, author equals, I don't know, neural nine, and then YouTube, if you have one, and then email if you have one and so on. Some information about you if you want to have some contact information up there. Uh, and then you can also do something uh, which is quite interesting. You can set some uh, hidden variables here, which are author, for example. So underscore, underscore, author, underscore, underscore. And you can set this to a string neural nine, for example. And you can do the same thing with email um, and, you know, mail at mail.mail, for example, and then you can do the same thing with uh, the status of the project. So you can say, for example, it is uh, currently still in the planning phase or whatever. Um, and then you can start to document the individual parts of your code, for example, classes, functions, and so on. So let's say we have a class person, for example, and this class person has, uh, let's say the init method here, Unit constructor, we have name, age, weight as always. And then we have self.name equals, come on, name and self.h equals age and self.weight equals weight. There you go. Um, and now what we can do here if we don't have, or let's add one method here. Let's say we have get older, for example, and we pass years and then we say self dot h equals uh, h plus or actually self dot h, dot h plus equals years and then maybe we we'll return that h as well just so we get the information um and here we can now do something like a multi-line comment and we say okay this is the <clears throat> person class for the project whatever uh, and then we can do something like attributes and underline this like that. And then we can add some private attributes here. And we don't have any private attributes here. We only have public attributes. But for example, if something starts with underscore underscore, we would do something like name equals or not equals. We, we would say something like name, then the data type, for example, uh, str and then we would describe what it is. So this is a name and so on. We would do the same thing for public here. 
So I don't want to go into too much detail here. You can take a look at Vitstream. I'm going to show you in a second how I did it there. Uh, we can do the same thing with methods, of course. So we say methods underscore 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 uh, and or actually you can go with dash 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 uh, and then private public again the same thing and the function uh, the functions itself are probably the more uh, the most important thing that you want to document because there you have some keywords also PyCharm has some keywords I think it's also going to autocomplete them so if I start with three quotation marks here it already autocompletes with uh, param so we have param for parameter uh, of course I can say a constructor for person and then I have param name and I can say okay name the name of the person right so I can do the same thing here for age the age of the person uh, of the person and so on um, but usually you do this for functions where it's not so clear what we're doing obviously if we have a constructor and name age weight we know what that is uh, but here for example you know we could start with uh, param years the or you can say how many years the person is getting older I don't even know if that's grammatically correct to be honest um, get older function and so on and then we also have the keyword return which basically says okay what is this uh, return value what are we going to get as a result the uh, new h okay so that is how it works um, and that is just good to have that in your code, especially for functions. Now you don't need to necessarily do all of this if you don't like to, uh, but especially for the functions, it's useful to have a basic description, uh, to have basic parameter information and return values and all that. Uh, because I also think that if I go and create a person now, um, a person object, let's say I add, let me just add none, none, and none. I'm not sure if I'm not going to be able to see some doc strings here. There you go. So you can see, I can, I can see the doc strings in the preview in PyCharm. I can see params, name, the age of the person, age, the age of the person, weight, nothing because we didn't specify anything. Uh, so this is quite useful. Also, if I go with p1.getOlder, I should be able to, if I pass 12, for example, I should be able to get some basic information by hovering here you can see params return value so it's also formatted by PyCharm if you use the proper format and in general it's just more professional to do it like that so you can go to neural9 uh, not neural9 not <laughs> neural9.com uh, to github.com slash neural9 uh, slash vidstream and you can check out the streaming.py file there you can see that I have uh, the same structure I have some basic comments I have um, uh, class class documentation here for each function. I have the parameters listed and all that in a different format. Maybe I should change that to the PyCharm format here. Uh, but you can see what it does basically. Um, and yeah, th this is this is making your code a little bit more professional, especially if you have a large code base. It's good to have it documented so people that want to contribute to it or use it know what you're doing in your code. All right, and last but not least, we're going to talk about something that is also going to influence the performance, not only the readability and the documentation of the code. Uh, and this is one of those things that I actually do in my code. So the first two things, type hinting and documentation, they make your code more professional, but my code on GitHub as of right now is not really professional. Maybe I'm going to change that, but this third thing is actually something that I really do. And it is using list comprehensions or in general, these functions like filter, reduce and so on. Uh, instead of doing everything manually with loops. So for example, uh, what would be a bad example um, of, or a bad practice example, let's say we have some numbers here and we say this is just a list range uh, 100. So we have 100 values here. Uh, and now what we wanna do is we wanna create a list that has all these numbers squared. So what could we do here? We could say squared equals empty list and we could say four X or for number in numbers squared dot append a number squared. And we can also do something like that. We can also say if a number modulo five equals zero. So if the number is divisible by five, then add it to the list. 
Uh, and you can see right away, first of all, that if I hover with a mouse here, it says convert for loop into list comprehension because PyCharm says, okay, this is not intelligent to do it that way. PyCharm already recognizes that this is not a good way uh, to fill up that list with, uh, with squares. So what we want to do instead, this is bad practice. What we want to do instead is we want to use a list comprehension that has the same effect, but it's going to be more efficient. Uh, and it's a more declarative functional approach to programming. So uh, the same thing could be done as squared equals and then number for number or actually sorry, number squared for number in numbers if number modulo five equals zero. Now for someone who does not understand list comprehensions, this might be a little bit uh, less readable. But most people that or actually all people that program in Python on a regular basis and contribute meaningfully to projects will understand this uh, as well. So they will understand this probably even better than this. Uh, so this is just a bad practice. And this is a good practice. This is what you should be doing. Um, you should not be using full loops and empty lists and append statements. You should use list comprehensions for, for stuff like that. Uh, and now another example, for example, which is not a uh, list comprehension, but it's a filtering process. Let's say you want to have the numbers, but you want to filter out all the numbers that are, uh, that are uh, divisible by five. So you want to have all the numbers that are divisible by five. What can you do? You can say, okay, um, filtered list is an empty list. And then we can say for this time, I'm going to choose X as a name for X in numbers, we're going to say, if X modulo five equals zero, and let's also say, and X modulo three equals zero. So we want to have both of them. If that is the case, then uh, we're going to say filtered list dot append X. So uh, this in a sense can also be turned into a list comprehension. As you can see, if I hover here, turn into list comprehension, but it can also be done with the filter method. So we can also, or function, uh, we can also go ahead and say filtered list equals, and then we can say filter, or actually we need to say list filter because filter returns a filter object and list turns it into a list. So list filter. Uh, and first we specify the function. What is the function going to be? It's going to be Lambda x um, and we're going to say x modulo five equals zero and x modulo three equals zero and the collection is going to be numbers so i can delete that and if we run this if we print that we're going to see that this produces the same result. We can get all the numbers that are divisible by five and three and this is more efficient now you should always use something like that. You should either use filter, reduce, map, or you should use a list comprehension, but you should not uh, use these loops where you start with an empty list and you fill up the list with append statements uh, based on certain conditions. This is inefficient and it's not the Pythonic way of doing things nowadays. All right, so that's it for today's video. Those were the three major points that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I think they're pretty important, but of course, being a professional Python coder is not limited to those three things. Those are three things that I think are important, type hinting, documentation, and uh, using list comprehensions and efficient functions instead of doing it in a slow and old way. Uh, if you want to have more inspirations for design principles while coding, uh, you can open up your idle or any Python interpreter that can execute your statements, and you can type import this, and you're going to get the Zen of Python. Um, which is part of Python itself. So it's not some library that you install. And then you can see some principles like beautiful is better than ugly. Explicit is better than implicit. This is another principle. You want to write explicit Python code, not implicit Python code. Simple is better than complex and so on. You can read that and get an idea of how Python code is written. And of course, you can just Google how to make your Python code more professional. There are a lot of resources out there. Uh, but this is it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed and hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting a like button, leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.